All right, welcome back to the Castro Files. Hi guys, how, how are you? Are you? Doing? I'm Good. doing well, thank getting you. Getting ready to getting used to this new mic. The new mic. Yes. Trying to change things up. You know, like like so you can keep me on my toes a little bit. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Hope you're having a good day. Check us out real quick. We'll get some of the business out of the way real quick. Okay. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify for the audio. Of course, you can give us a like and subscribe. It's going to be out under the bar is open for those. Yes. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, of course, if you haven't already. Appreciate it. And then also go out, check out the Castro Files, all of our swag out on Modern, or I was going to say Modern Mountaineer. It used to be that. It's yeah. Minor League Studios forward slash Castro Files. You can find all of our good stuff out there. We've got some cool t shirts, some alien yeah. heads. We've got some tumblers, some cups, some phone cases. Bunch of cool stuff. All sorts Baseball of cool caps. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Really so cool stuff. Go check that out if you yeah. don't mind. So today, Beth's going to. Share some stories. Some stories. These I've ones got are a gonna be pretty good. I'm excited. They're uh, it's from they're they're supposed they're supposedly true. They're ghost stories. So it tr says uh, true ghost stories, frightening accounts of haunted houses, paranormal mysteries, and unexplained phenomenon by Selena Hart. Awesome. Uh, I'm reading two short ones today. Okay. So they're really cool. Awesome. Let's get into it. I'm excited. All right. This first one is called Something in the Dark. Get my trusty pen. And got your paper. pen for your questions. Yep. There you go. Okay. It all started when I was 12 years old. I wasn't aware of the strange happenings right away, but I remember when my parents moved my sister, brother, and I into my grandparents' old house, the hauntings began. Due to hardship and a series of unfortunate events, at the time, we suddenly found ourselves homeless. Thankfully, my grandparents took us in. At first, the sudden move seemed like an adventure. The house sat on a sprawling five acres of land in beautiful Montana. But deep inside myself, I knew there was something not right about my grandparents' house. It wasn't anything you could put your finger on. The best way to describe it is a feeling of dread. I tried to dismiss it to the strangeness and uneasiness of my new surroundings. After all, this was an old house. But eventually, the feelings of dread and the thickness of the air became overwhelming. As time went by, our mother started acting strange. She was oh, she had always been a loving mother to us and a wonderful and had a wonderful sense of humor. She would often joke with us. However, in the months since our move, she began to change. She would unexpectedly fly off the handle over nothing. It was like she was so angry all the time. Instead of her usual loving self, she was always drained, sick, or angry. One time she went to visit my older sister in South Carolina. She stayed with her for a few months. As soon as she was away from the old house, she was back to normal. Uh, back to her normal and was herself again. As soon as she was away from the house, she was back. Oh, I read that part twice. Sorry. It was as if something in the house would influence her personality or possess her. Yeah. One night, my sister and I were laying on our bed in the dark. It was very late and everyone in the house was asleep. My mom had gone to stay with my older sister again for a few weeks. We whispered in the night, confirming our worries, our dreams, and our fears to one another. Mom is so different in the house, I told her. I know, she murmured. She has changed. It's like she's another person. We snuggled in bed and found refuge and comfort in each other's arms. Across the room, a creak interrupted our conversation. The door began to gradually open. A dark figure was standing in the doorway. Who is it? I stammered. There was no answer. I couldn't make out any distinct features except for one, a set of menacing red eyes. They pierced through the darkness. My sister and I stared in disbelief at the entrance. Then we heard it, a very low, creepy laugh. My heart started to pound, and then without a warning, the dark figure disappeared. My sister and I stared for what seemed like several seconds before anyone spoke. Finally, I got up. We assumed it was our brother trying to mess with us. We rushed to the doorway, but there was nothing there. Our brother, who slept at the far end of the house, so I knew he couldn't have done this trick and run down without us hearing him and seeing him. I tiptoed in my brother's room as quickly as I could. He was sound asleep. Later in our room, we tried to convince ourselves our eyes were playing tricks on us. Secretly, we knew that we both had seen something we couldn't explain. Eventually, we fell asleep, but after several minutes, I felt something sitting on my feet. The pressure woke me up. When I tried to move my feet, I couldn't. I cried out and startled my sister awake. She screamed and the sensation stopped. She looked at me seriously and said, there was something dark sitting on your bed watching you, she shouted. I don't know what was sitting on my bed that night. I never did find out, but what I do know is that it was evil. There were, very, there were many paranormal events over the years in that house. At 17, I had moved out of my parents' house and was on my own. 
The strange and creepy paranormal experiences my sister and I had endured as children in that house were in my past, and I suppressed them until they were almost forgotten. A few years later, I was married and the mother of two small children. My parents built a small house on their property. It was next door to their house, but with enough distance that we had our own place and privacy. There were plenty of acres with lots of trees on the land. It seemed like an idyllic place to raise children with lots of space for my beautiful Labrador. We moved in. My husband started working late at night, and I was often left alone with the kids. Thankfully, my dog kept me company. One night, I heard whimpering outside my door. Come on, girl, come inside. I opened the door to call to my bed, call her to my bedside. She sat motionless outside the door. What's the matter? I noticed she never entered my room by herself. She, to, she often had to be led through the door and had the habit of resisting. I called her again, but she wouldn't budge. Finally, after several attempts at coaxing her, I pulled her through the door and into my room. She lay on my bed as I stroked her soft fur. Something captured her attention. She looked in the direction of my closet and with a blank stare. I shut the bedroom door and plopped in the bed. She continued to gaze at the closet for a very long time. She did not waver, but obediently stayed by my side. What's the matter, girl? Then I heard it, a noise coming from outside my room. The door creaked. Slowly, it began to open, and with every inch, my heart raced. My husband walked in. Oh, it's you, I sighed <laughs> yeah. with relief. What's she looking at, my husband asked curiously. I don't know. She's been staring at that corner for an hour. We finally settled for bed and were beginning to doze off when she got restless and started to whimper. I need to get some sleep, my husband complained under his breath. He got up to put her outside. Sometime during the night, I woke up with a stinging pain on my right leg. Something had scratched me. At first, I thought it was my dog. Then I remembered she wasn't in the room. I got up to turn on the bathroom light and saw two long red marks running down my thigh. What? I couldn't explain the scratches. I turned off the light before going back to bed. It was late, but I forced myself back to sleep. Later that night, I felt a deep, heavy pressure on my chest. I couldn't breathe. I started to grasp for air. It felt as if I were being suffocated. When I opened my eyes, I couldn't move. My body was paralyzed. Someone or something was holding me in place. Then I heard it, that sinister, low, creepy laugh. One I was all too familiar with from my childhood. It was the evil laugh from the entity that terrified us when we lived in the house next door. Ha, 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 ha. The laughter was maniacal, followed by heavy breathing on my face. I could only move my hand that was right by my husband, and I started hitting him until he finally woke up. He sat up startled. I was finally able to breathe. Whatever it was released me from his grip. I coughed and coughed and eventually caught my breath. My husband was catatonic. He stared at the corner of the room. I turned in the direction he was looking. We both sat frozen in disbelief. There next to the closet in the corner of the bedroom was an um, uh, was an on, well, ominous <laughs> figure. Wow. Tough words. Through the darkness of the room, we could see it blacker than night. But what was it? His red eyes pierced right through us. Then I remembered and I knew it was the same menacing, dark, evil figure that frightened my sister and I as children. It stared at me and tore the stillness of the night with a low guttural laugh as if to say, welcome back. Um, so this is just a footnote. According to A. Morrison's paranormal account told to Celinda Hart, geographically, our home fell on ley lines and Native American grounds. Our family property in Montana, I discovered, is within the boundaries of the Salish and Cotinia tribes. I do believe there is a de cor direct correlation to all the paranormal activity and unexplained phenomenon we experienced. At first, after several years, our family finally moved away. The spiritual activity had become far too frequent and was an overwhelming burden on all of us. I often felt attack and my husband had experienced a spiritual attachment and began to suffer physical ailments. I found out later that other people living on the same road had also experienced um, spiritual trauma. Eesh. So it sounds like it was because of where it was located. Yeah. Um, but I can't, I mean, worst nightmare, right? Is waking up to see so, red eyes. Uh, what is it like? Some people have said that that, Theoretically, it could be like sleep paralysis or something right. like that. Right. Right. When you get stuck, like you're in this middle zone of being awake and being asleep. And that's happened to me in the past where I've, like, I know I'm waking up, but I can't move. See, I've never thought Or something like that. And it's been a long time, but it has happened. Um, but I always I think it's weird because anything. these people that have it, they're always able to touch somebody and that Trigger, breaks off. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it does wake them up, but how know. would you know in your sleep to reach for your husband's hand? But that's what I always find fascinating about it is like you always hear about him and they're able to grab somebody mm -hmm. and it goes away. The people who aren't able to grab somebody are like stepped in that terrifying moment for, for longer, for longer. than so a couple of things. Have you ever been in a really, really creepy house? 
Like your dad's? Pe- my dad's house. You think it's creepy? Oh uh, yeah. Because it's in the woods. Well, it's old. Is that his? Well, kind of. It's not that old. It's older than but any my house. My grandmother's. The one that came to mind was my grandmother's. Which okay. Was built in like the sixties, I think. Okay. Maybe a little, or probably earlier than that, 50s or something like that in Hampton, New Hampshire. I feel like all the houses in Hampton are <laughs> kind of creepy. A lot of them are. Yeah. Um, but Like the, your aunt's hotel was creepy. That was creepy. That yeah. was built in, I think, in the 40s or 50s. And Matt and Angel's, it's a basement, but the basement is creepy. I just yeah. feel like there's creepy that stuff all over. old, old. Yeah. But my grandmother's, they, they built a bar, like what we would consider like a man cave. Okay. Back in the day. Had the black and white checkered like their entertainment tile. room kind yeah. of thing. Okay. Black and white checkered tile on the floor. I used to skateboard down there when it was raining out and <laughs> snowing. There was just enough room to kind of move around. Right. It was it was like the bar was beat up and right. stuff from years. The, like my my aunts and uncles, there was five of them, I think. Um, anyway, going down in there. So there was that room mm-hmm. right off the stairs. Okay. Go down the stairs, turn on the, the one creepy light. Right. But behind that, there was like an old wood shop, workshop back there. Okay. Then. Had old rusted tools and oh, stuff. Oh, that's cool. It's creepy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you're kind of like, because as, here's the thing. I was like, if 13. it was lower in the house, no matter, we were just talking about watching scary movies during the day because they're so creepy, you have to watch them during the day. That room in that basement was creepy even during the day, even during the day. because you were in the ground. Yeah. You know, Underground. so yeah. And being like a 13 year old kid. Imagination. There, oh yeah, your imagination can go wild. On then you, you have you're to like, wonder: was nope. it your was it your imagination? And no matter what, you always run up the stairs. Like no, I don't care. No, don't you remember the house in, in Colorado. Colorado Springs? <laughs> I would go throw laundry in and literally haul <laughs> right back upstairs and be like, "Oh my gosh, that place is so scary." Um, doing that was laundry a normal basement. Dunk. Yeah. Well, normal for people who've had basements. There's no such thing as a normal basement for somebody who's never right. lived in a house with a basement. The other thing that I creepy. was thinking is dogs, they just know. They, they have that, do. They have, they're connected. They're I almost think. like kids. Yeah, they're connected where they can to see. something. They can yeah. see other things. It's really interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, All that right. was a great segue because mm-hmm. this one is called The Cliff of Darkness. Um, nice. It's a story from Natalia Lazardi, who was born in Spain in 1901 great. and later moved to the States. The following is a true account of what happened to her when she was 16 years old. Nice. So the morning had quickly elapsed into afternoon as my three young sisters couldn't talk about anything else but going into town. Our house was close to the woods, not far from the beautiful, treacherous cliffs in Costa Brava, Spain. As children, my parents had forbid us to play close to the cliffs as they were very dangerous, and several people over the years had fallen to their deaths. Our cozy home was less than a couple miles outside the nearest Pueblo. It was a good walking distance for my family, and going into town meant going to the market and possibly buying new shoes. They could hardly contain themselves when my baby sister, Teresa, pulled my hand and tried to coax me to go with them. She didn't understand why I wanted to stay home. I offered to stay behind and finish the house chores, so my parents reluctantly agreed. The bustle and chatter from my sisters faded as everyone walked towards town. I secretly looked forward to having the spacious home to myself without my sisters entering the room or making noise while I tried to write my private thoughts in a diary. The house was silent, and as soon as they were out of earshot, I ran upstairs to my room and pulled my book of secrets from under a loose floorboard. Writing stories and poem in my personal journal was my favorite pastime. As a 16-year-old girl who shared a room with two sisters, moments of privacy were scarce and precious. As I lay on my bed, rays of orange light shone from the window and washed the room with warmth and quietude. The hours passed while I lay deep in thought on my small bed, when in the distance I heard faint music. It was low at first, and gradually the mysterious melody became louder as if the wind and the trees had carried it closer to my home until it was almost outside my window. For a moment, I sat still listening and soon deciphered an unfamiliar, beautiful piece played on a wood instrument. The tune was filled with musical notes and minor, compelling and mysterious in its sound. It seemed to approach until it was right below my window, beckoning me to come out. The amidst, then amidst the alluring melody, I heard my name. At first, it was a whisper. Natalia. Someone was calling me. Natalia. Come. I didn't recognize the voice, but it seemed to be coming from the woods. I looked outside the window from the second floor, yet I couldn't see anyone. I could hear the strange music, soft, and a voice in the distance. Natalia, Natalia, come here. The music mixed with a strange voice seemed to put me in a trance-like stupor. I remember staring out in the vicinity of the woods for several minutes before turning around and taking slow, 
deliberate steps down the stairs and out the door. Natalia, the voice called, and I obediently walked deeper and deeper into the woods. A fierce wind had blown in from the ocean. It picked up unexpectedly and swayed the tree branches back and forth in my path as I walked into the dark woods. Above, the sky looked more like nightfall. It was getting late. My parents always warned us about not going into the woods alone and especially not in the dark. I knew I shouldn't be out at this time and my parents and sisters would be coming home soon. Still, I didn't seem to have any control of myself and kept walking further into the dark woods. The voice kept calling my name and the melody was so compelling. It seemed to have a strange hypnotic hold on me. Dark clouds had rolled in and it looked like nighttime had unexpectedly descended. I kept walking towards the voice until suddenly I found myself past the woods and a few feet away from the edge of the forbidden cliffs. How could the afternoon have turned into night in a matter of only minutes? I couldn't see very well in front of me. And when I suddenly stopped, I'm sorry, I couldn't see very well in front of me when I suddenly stopped. In my head, I heard my parents' verbal warning. Don't go into the woods alone and stay away from the cliffs of darkness. Standing a few feet away from me was the outline of a tall, dark shadow. He was standing at the edge of the cliff facing me only a few feet away with the horizon behind him. And several hundred feet below were the rocks and the angry sea. I could hear the waves crashing violently, and although I knew it was late, every, any remnants of sunlight had completely vanished. Who? Who are you? I stammered almost inaudibly. I was met with silence. The strange figure did not answer me, and I felt an empty pit in my stomach. I could not make out any features from the shadow. Who are you? My voice trembled. I could only make out an arm rising and motioning me to come closer. I was gripped with fear, and yet I couldn't scream or move a muscle. My right hand, <clears throat> excuse me, my right hand reached for my gold medal medallion hanging from my neck. My fingers felt the imprint of the sacred heart carved delicately in the precious heirloom that had been passed down from my grandmother. She had given it to my mother and on my 15th birthday and as the oldest daughter, my mom had given it to me. Frozen and paralyzed, I tried to recognize any facial features from the dark figure. The oncoming storm had rendered an almost pitch black night, making it almost impossible to see anything. Only his eyes shone a fiery red light burning coals, and I thought my vision was playing tricks on me. I kept staring as he stretched out his hand. He knew my name, and his low voice called to me, Come closer. He kept repeating my name in a low, baritone voice and more and with more and more urgency. I thought my heart was going to come out of my chest. It palpitated so hard I could feel it pound with every beat. Just then, lightning lit up the sky, followed by thunder, and at that same moment, it seemed to wake me from my trance. Lightning struck again, and for a few seconds, I got a good look at the mysterious figure. Jetting out of his head were prominent, long, narrow horns that curved at the end like an animal. I know, I got goosebumps. His face was long and distorted. He resembled a large goat. His body was covered with fur, and his legs were strange, somewhat deformed, as if he was half man and half animal. I went into shock at that sudden realization. This was not a man. What was this thing? It wasn't an animal because he could speak and he seemed to know my name. This is not a human being at all, but what was it? It was so frightening. My legs buckled and I fell weak to the ground on my knees. Paralyzed and unable to move or get up, I closed my eyes tight and placed the medallion in my mouth, clenching it hard with my teeth, and I began to pray fervently. I prayed and prayed. Our Father who art in heaven, over and over, I kept repeating the Lord's Prayer without letting go of my medallion. My hair blew wildly with a torrent night wind lashing at my face, and after what felt like a long time, the wind sub subdued and the dark clouds eventually dispersed. Then silence. I slowly opened my eyes and saw there was light in the sky again. I was still on my hands and knees and had somehow gathered the courage and energy I had to get up. I found myself standing wobbly at the very edge of the cliff. One more step and I would have fallen to my death. I gathered my strength and could see the water lashing violently at the rocks below. The dark, menacing figure was gone. I could tell it was dark and it was dusk in the horizon when I blinked several times and gradually felt myself recover what seemed like a living nightmare. I don't remember what happened next except my heart beat very fast and tears rolled up inside me. I found myself running desperately through the woods all the way home. Thin branches hit my face as I scurried haphazardly home. Twigs scratched my Twigs scratched me on my face and arms and it stung, but I didn't stop running. I pushed the front door open and once inside the living room of our home, I ran to my father's arm babbling and crying. The tears were still streaming down my face as I recounted what had happened to me. Everyone stared at me, stunned. My sisters were quiet at first and then burst, 
burst out laughing. They thought I was playing a joke on them. To my dismay, no one believed me. My sisters and my mother said I was being overly dramatic and warned me to stop joking. I didn't make up the story I yelled and pleaded with them. Then I remembered as I pulled out my medallion and told them how I had bitten it several times with my teeth and prayed fervently for God's help. Everyone suddenly stopped stopped talking and stared at my mother as she slowly approached me and held the sacred heart of Jesus in her hand to investigate it closely. Around it were many teeth marks I had permanently left on the gold medallion. Um, So it has been many years, so the, the young lady telling the story explains, it's been many years since my grandmother's terrifying experience. She never saw the evil figure again, but said on rare occasions she swore she could still hear the music and her name being called in the distance. This occurred throughout her early years as she grew up until she married and finally moved away from her hometown and away from the woods. The story has been passed down generations in our family. I know the story to be true because I now have her gold medallion and it still has evidence of her teeth mark when she cleansed in fear before the dark and sinister figure at the cliff of darkness. Yeesh, that last little bit. I yeah. was like, oh, yeah. I just got chills. Yeah. Like, when they start describing him, yeah, yeah, me too. I was like, oh, he's creepy. What is it with the red eyes all the I time? I literally wrote down red eyes, I both don't, stories. I, I, That's a very common kind of thing, I like think. Like demonic in, kind of thing? In stories, <clears throat> yeah. It's, well, because uh, Amityville Horror had the pig with red eyes. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's like red eyes always this is, denotes This is the devil. Evil. It's the goat, right? Yeah. It's like the, the visual you get. It's like... And then you have to wonder if all those people that have died on that cliff over the years were lured there. Because of the property. Right. Or something about the property. Yeah. Or that, yeah, yeah, it's creepy. But I was like, sleepwalking, I don't know... If I mean, sleepwalking could happen, yeah, right? Yeah, no. But sleepwalking through the, off woods, a, through the woods, but like not running into a tree off a cliff, <laughs> like or yeah. I was a sleepwalker as a child, and I did make did it you down get outside. I did get outside. We were visiting oh my, my grandmother, um, and it was in Brownsville, Texas, and they didn't have air conditioning, so the doors and windows were all open, so the screen door was there. Um, my pa- the family was still awake, so I was a kid. I was probably like eight, so I was okay. probably in bed, and I got up from the couch that I was sleeping on and started walking down the stairs. And onto the sidewalk, and my mom and dad were like, "Is she were they watching you?" Yeah, oh. and they're like, "Where are you going?" And I told them I had to catch the train. It was like ten o'clock at night, eleven <laughs> o'clock at night, some... and they just turned me around, and said, "Okay, well, you have to go this way." And I just went back to bed and laid down. So you can sleepwalk, and like, That's I guess saying. if you, you know your surroundings places. well enough, you can not stumble. Yeah. Um, but I feel like if she didn't go in the woods that often, she wouldn't have had that confidence to right, walk. You're gonna trip over something, yeah. stub your toe, and yeah. step on a thorn or step on something. Even on trails, you know, you trip right. and stumble. So yeah, yeah. I just so I thought you. both of those were really interesting. Yeah, very good stories yeah. today. Thanks. Appreciate that. That was awesome. Creepy houses and creepy woods. Yeah. No matter what. Ghost stories. Yeah, I ghost love stories them. Those are great. So thank you all so much for checking out the Castro Files this week. Yes, sir. Go out. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel if you yes. don't mind. If you haven't Share it already. with your friends. Yep. What's it? What you... Sharing is caring. We'll get past that someday. It's awesome, though. You bring it out. Awesome. Right. Thank you so much. All right. I take care. Bye, everybody. guys. Love See you. See you next time. Cheers.